James Randi's remarkable water dousing discovery in 1980, confirmed not only by Arthur C. Clarke, but also by the German government, in a 10-year landmark study. Water dousing in arid regions. In an article published in the peer-reviewed Journal of Scientific Exploration, a science journal with the editorial offices at Stanford University, Professor Hans Dieter Betz, a physicist at the University of Munich, presents the results of a German government-sponsored program to test and apply dousing methods to locate water sources in arid regions. This 10-year project involved over 2,000 drillings in Sri Lanka, Zaire, Kenya, Namibia, Yemen, and other countries, and is thus the most ambitious experiment with water dousing ever carried out. Many studies of dousing applications have been made over the past century or so, but such research has always been vulnerable to insidious skeptical criticism, pseudo-skepticism, that their evidence was too biased or too anecdotal to be offered as definitive scientific proof of the efficacy of dousing. The enormity of the clean water shortage in arid countries led the German government to initiate a long-range program via the German Association for Technical Cooperation to explore innovative water detection methods in arid regions. Motivated by both the high cost and modest success rate of purely conventional hydrogeological methods, the GDZ project team geological experts, experienced dowsers, and a scientific group led by Professor Betts to monitor and evaluate the results and principally, the achievements of an engineer on the GDZ project management staff, Hans Schroeder, who was also a water diviner, of proven ability, who could locate deep or shallow groundwater sources with pinpoint accuracy, and also determine their depth and their potential yield prior to drilling. Without detailed geological knowledge of the areas he was working in, Schroeder worked alongside professional hydrogeologists on a variety of groundwater development projects in Sri Lanka, the Philippines, the Dominican Republic, Congo, Niger, Yemen, the Cape Verde Islands, Kenya, Namibia, and the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt, to locate over 2,000 boreholes with staggeringly high project success rates of 80% to 96%, even in these desert and semi-desert areas, where the comparable conventional methods achieved much lower success rates of only 10% to 50%. Statistical evaluation of Schroeder's ability in a controlled experiment was made in a direct comparison with the efforts of an expert hydrogeology and geophysics team. Targets for minimum individual borehole yield and total yield were set, and under these tough goal oriented test conditions, Hans Schroeder proved to be more successful than the hydrogeology team by a factor of 4x. Science has got to wake up and take notice when one man with relatively little geological knowledge, his humble faith, and his divining rod, can pinpoint and assess groundwater aquifers with fourfold greater accuracy, and the best efforts of a professional team of geoscientists and a heap of expensive geophysical equipment. The study makes repeated observations that Schroeder and other competent water diviners were consistently able to identify from a distance, then pinpoint and assess fresh groundwater sources in terms of exact location, depth range and potential yield with a degree of accuracy far beyond the capability of even the best geophysical instruments and most educated hydrogeological guesswork. The outcome was striking. An overall success rate of 96% by dowsers was achieved in 691 drillings in Sri Lanka. Based on geological experience in that area, a success rate of 30 to 50% would be expected from conventional techniques alone. But the overall success rate is not the only indication that the dousing phenomenon is of considerable practical use. According to Betts, what is both puzzling but enormously useful is that in hundreds of cases the dousers were able to predict the depth of the water source and the yield of the well to within 10 to 20 percent. We carefully considered the statistics of these correlations and they far exceeded lucky guesses. Numerous conventional explanations for the success of dousing located drill sites were carefully examined by Betts in a series of reports summarized in the article. Virtually all of the drill sites were in regions where the odds of finding water by random drilling were extremely low, thus eliminating the success by chance hypothesis. Another argument sometimes advanced is that dousers get subtle clues from the landscape and geology, perhaps without even being consciously aware of their highly developed detective skills. This too was ruled out in various ways, the most impressive being the ability of dowsers to locate underground sources, often 100 feet down, who
who streams are so narrow that misplacing the drill site by a few feet would yield a dry hole. Such precision is far beyond any no geological indicators. Betts conjectures that there may be subtle electromagnetic gradients resulting from the fissures and water flows creating changes in the electrical properties of rock and soil. The dowsers somehow sense these gradients in a hypersensitive state. Says Betts, I'm a scientist, and those are my best plausible scientific hypotheses at this point. But there are two things that I am certain of after 10 years of field research. A combination of dowsing and modern hydrogeophysical techniques can be both more successful and far less expensive than we had thought. And we need to run a lot more tests, because in a 10-year study, we have established that dowsing works, confirming the great James Randi's dowsing discovery in 1980, confirmed by Arthur C. Clarke, then. What are we to make of Randi's test for dowsing? The experiment was well designed, but I don't quite agree with his conclusions. The test for water and the test for metal were entirely separate experiments. He shouldn't have combined the results. The dowsers were hopeless at finding metals. They'd have done much better if they'd merely guessed. But the results for water are rather impressive. By chance alone, the dowsers should have been right 10% of the time. Their actual score was 22%. The odds are 100 to 1 against that happening by chance. So the dowsers were quite good at locating water. They weren't as infallible as they claimed to be, but they were distinctly better than Randy admits. I've been able to find only one experiment that suggests how dowsing may actually work. On the campus of Utah State University at Logan, Professor Dwayne Chadwick is preparing the ground for the latest in a series of dowsing tests. He hopes to establish a connection between dowsing reactions and the Earth's magnetic field, using student volunteers hijacked on their way to classes. Before the test begins, Chadwick measures the magnetic field every foot along the path. Then he buries a piece of wire coat hanger in the snow, which will cause a distinct change, a distortion in the Earth's That's magnetic field. Really hard. The tests are designed to discover whether dowsers can detect changes in the Earth's magnetic field, like the one caused by the coat hanger. Any movement of the rods a dowsing reaction is carefully recorded. Chadwick got the idea from a local newspaper story. I saw something that made me really wonder. Two boys fell through the ice on the Snake River and were drowned. The search party couldn't find them, and a dowser came along and located them after the search party had given up. That got me thinking there must be some scientific basis on which that might work, because here's a whole river of water. Obviously, it wasn't the water. And uh, I, I postulated that the skates would distort the Earth's magnetic field. Underground water also causes such distortions. Perhaps dowsers can tune into them. This might explain the basis of dowsing. But why should the rods twitch? I postulated again that here we have a, the human body, which is a really a conductor of electricity. And as you cut the magnetic field, this causes micro voltages to be induced into the, the tissues, the muscles. That shortens the muscle. It causes a slight misalignment of the hands, subconsciously, not consciously, and causes a dowsing response. In a previous test, students doused a 60-foot long path. Unknown to them, Chadwick had buried a piece of wire coat hanger at a spot 26 feet along it. The dowsing reactions were grouped in bunches, especially over the wire. 23 out of 25 people got a reaction within three feet of that spot. And statistically, of course, that's, you could break the bank at Monte Carlo with those kind of odds. <laughs> and we did show that they tended to get reactions where the magnetic field is changing. The magnetic field is changing most where the graph is steepest. And that's where the dowsing reactions are bunched. Based on our uh, 
our statistical evidence, I think there is a, prop, a possibility that this is the this is the mechanism by which the dowsing reaction occurs.